we're only a tiny particle in a really complex um, you know, system of, that has you know, infinite amount of, of interactions. Hi, and welcome to Nothing is Rocket Science. Uh, it's a podcast where we talk about the nuances. We discuss the nuances of everything science and scientific. Uh, today, I'm going to be picking um, the brains of uh, Nico, pun intended there. Um, so um, Nico is a biolo biological anthropologist. Um, he's studying the evolution of intelligence in animals to understand why in humans are so cognitively specialized. In particular, he focuses on the evolution of brain areas and connectivity patterns that encode higher order cognition, learning, decision making, and habit formation. He's also passionate about uh, research and uh, science communication. He's also a data visualizer and a graphic designer. So uh, he also constantly advocates for the inclusion of his historically underrepresented and vulnerable segments of the scientific community in diverse domestic and international projects, such as the Royal Academy of Science, Science, Science International Trust and United Nations. So that's quite a mouthful of an introduction, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have a very interesting discussion. So welcome to the podcast, Nico. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sandhya, for the invitation and uh, the production uh, of all this. I mean, it's an amazing podcast and I really enjoy uh, listening to to that so you know congratulations to you and and it's a ter terrific work so thank you so much for for, for everything in the invitation and just having the time and the passion to yeah. uh, to talk about neuroscience yeah no this is like it's, com it's completely my pleasure it's great to have you um so before we actually get on to you know the actual topic um Evolutionary neuroscience is something that you know. I I I come from a vision science background, and I've I've studied a bit of neuroscience. But uh, evolutionary neuroscience is probably the first time I've ever heard. It's a unique area, and uh, you have a background of anthropology. Um, I found that very interesting. So can you tell us a little about what made you decide? Like, was there an incident or a story that you know helped you decide that you're going to marry both these professions together? Yeah, I mean, that is a wonderful question. And that is something that, you know, brings me back to so, so many years, uh, you know, in my life, uh, especially, you know, my first and second year of, of my undergraduate education back in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So um, since I was a kid, I was always super, super interested in how everything evolved, how, you know, why life is the way it is, and why do we have so many forms of life? Uh, and I was born and raised in a, in a rural uh, part of Argentina, which is actually the southernmost country in the world. So we have so much, uh, you know, nature, so, you know, so many species, so much biodiversity that uh, especially growing up on a, on a rural setting, I was able to have, you know, access to nature um, at, at all times. So when I was a kid, I, I really liked to go to the countryside and, you know, with my friends and my brother, Kind of like explored and you know um kind of like go, going around and, and you know exploring the, the type of birds the type of uh, you know animals that you can see around the type of plants the trees and all that so i was since i was a kid i was really fascinated by by all the biodiversity that is uh, surrounding us and always uh understanding us you know humans as you know part of that nature um you know complex that we all live in we're you know, living on the same place, we're living on the same uh, planet Earth. And that is also why, you know, studying diversity and, you know, uh, encouraging and promoting, um, you know, conservation of that biodiversity is so, so important. It was so present for me at a really early age. So at the same time, you know, being born in, and raised in, a, in, a, in the countryside of, of my country in South America, um, we always have a lot of contact with Native American populations. Um, so when I was a kid, it is very common in the countryside that you, you know, uh, find things on, on the floor, right, on, on the countryside, like mm -hmm. uh, stone tools or like these um, stone bowls that uh, Native Americans used to build just to hunt uh, different, uh, you know, moving prey. Uh, so you know, when I was a kid, I started collecting all those things and talking to people and like 
kind of like I build up my my little museum at, ha uh, at my house uh, at my at my house, and so that interest for you know studying evolution and studying like history and the in the uh, material remains of of ancient populations was something that was really present. So when I was finishing high school uh, at around 16, 17, 18 years old, and I decided what to study, um, you know, for, for college, I, you know, I, I never had any difficulty in, in deciding what to study. And, and I chose to study anthropology, which is basically defined as the study of uh, human complexity. Um, so I, I decided to go to a, to rather small university, uh, many of the, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of the education in my country in Argentina is free. So I went to a public school. Uh, and, um, you know, during my first year of, um, of education, I, I, I felt that, uh, you know, the, I was more closely um, passionate about the biological aspect, the evolutionary aspects of the evolution of um, Native American populations or human populations in general, or, you know, our species. Um, so I, I, you know, dive really deep into doing research in what is called biological anthropology, which is one of the disciplines, sub-disciplines of anthropology, which is related to the diversity and um, evolutionary aspects of, um, of humans as a species. And I remember very, very clearly in my first year um, at the university back in 2010, um, I was watching a um, neuroscience program in the Argentinian television, um, led by one of the, the most prolific neuroscientists, um, current neuroscientists in, in my country. Um, and I remember talking to my family about it and, you know, just arriving to the conclusion that Wow, um, everything, every single thing that we are, that we do, that we think, every single thing is, you know, related to our brains. It, it is literally our brains in action, mm -hmm. our brains in interaction to one another. And since I was studying the diversity and the evolution of, of us as a species, I was, you know, kind of like fitting all the pieces together that I needed to study the brain in order to fully understand who we are and why we are here as a species. Mm. So uh, it was a very you know, nice transition from anthropology, general anthropology, uh, biological anthropology, and then studying the evolutionary aspect of anthropology, which is called here in this country, evolutionary anthropology. And within that, doing neuroscience, actually studying how our brains, the human brain, which is the most complex system ever studied in science has evolved. Yeah, that's that's actually uh, thanks for painting that story. Because, um, like, you know, I, I had a couple of questions about, like, you know, were you passionate growing up? Uh, were you passionate mm -hmm. about science growing up? But I think you wonderfully covered all that. And uh, so what how did you decide to move to the States for uh, you're doing your PhD right now? So what what made you uh, move to the States for your PhD? Yeah, besides so, uh, besides your career, besides just, you know, getting getting into a school here, there might be other reasons. So if you can tell us what's that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, I finished my uh, bachelor's uh, degree in Argentina. And for the last, uh, you know, in, uh, in Argentina is typically five to six years of an undergrad, which is not mm -hmm. uh, common here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, during my fourth, five uh, and final year of my, of my bachelor's degree, because we need to write a thesis and, th um, and, and conduct research, um, I was seriously considering and applying for different programs abroad. Um, and specifically uh, the United States, because uh, you know, the education here is uh, fantastic, one of the best in the world. And actually the programs in anthropology in this country are extremely, extremely good and they're really well funded. So um, I applied for different scholarships and fellowships. Uh, fortunately, I got a, a Fulbright um, doctoral fellowship, which allowed me to cover my first two years uh, of my PhD um, here in the United States. Uh, so yeah, basically I was able to secure funding and um, secure um, you know, several admissions to several universities, but then I had the power to decide um, you know, where, where I should go. 
And I chose specifically Stony Brook University uh, located here in, in New York um, because um, I, you know, I was, and I'm still, still am fascinated by the work of my advisor, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeroen Smyers, which is, he is one of the um, worldwide, uh, you know, specialist in the evolution of the brain using phylogenetic comparative methods, which is basically um, the statistical way that we have to model uh, and understand the evolutionary uh, trajectory of different traits that we can actually measure um, on, on current living species. Okay, yeah. Um... So I think well let's let's move on to you know I have a lot of questions and I'm pretty sure our <laughs> audience also would be like curious to know about you know these two uh, aspects of our human brain. Uh, so starting with uh, you know evolution, um, so all of us know that you know we've evolved from lower animals to like primates and then humans. Uh, so how has the brain evolved from? from lower or lower order animals to like primates and then humans. And uh, what kind of evidence do we have to support this? Absolutely. I mean, that, that is that is a fundamental question. And is that question is at the core of all the researchers around the world that, you know, work on evolutionary neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, um, every um, species that is a vertebrate uh, has a brain. And some other species, which are not uh, vertebrates, such as you know insects, uh, they also have some sort of analog to a to a little brain, and that is fascinating. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, nature has found a way to centralize information processing in something, uh, in something that is you know central for for us, which is located on the on the vertebral, um, you know, column on the spine of every single one of the vertebrates. And that way to centralize information is uh, located in one organ, and that organ is the brain. So by definition, all the vertebrates uh, have brains, and different uh, clades, meaning different families of animals, different orders, have um, um, evolved and shaped their brains according to the environment and according to the selective pressures that they were facing uh, over evolutionary time. And we are talking about millions of years of evolution. Right. So basically the, the, the organ we have right now in 2021, it is an organ that has been evolving for millions of years. Uh, and it is basically responsible for every single thing that that is your life, right? Your dreams, your actions, your thoughts, um, every, your, your, your um, you know, uh, your consciousness, uh, all the motor plans that allow you to, you know, wake up uh, and, you know, leave the bed and, and start working and take a shower. Right. And all those things are uh, based on our brain. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and, and other species have find uh, their way to evolve their brains according to what they need in terms of their cognitive specializations, but also in terms of their ecological demands of their environments. Great. And... Uh... How how is this how is the human brain different from that of our immediate ancestors? Like if I have to compare the human brain with like primates or like, like chimpanzees and like the different categories of primates, uh, mm -hmm. we share a lot of similarities. But uh, how are they similar and how are they different? How did we evolve? Yeah, that, like absolutely. Um, so let me summarize this. Um, the to understand brain evolution, we need to understand this concept, which is we always have something new and something borrowed. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, we we are uh, a single species, which are uh, is Homo sapiens, which literally our scientific name is, you know, the species that think, right? So mm -hmm. that is that is why it's so central to understand our brain because it's literally like really the, the our own definition of who we are as species. We are Homo sapiens, but Homo and other uh, our ancestors in in the Homo lineage, as well as our most um, 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 you know uh, close uh, relatives, which are great apes, uh, which are also known as Hominidae, uh, we are all part of primates. So we are primates, and the thing is that primates within the the all 
primates is an order of mammals, right? And primates, in comparison to other mammals, they are extremely different and specialized. And basically, just to make this really long evolutionary history a, a little bit simple, and of course, this is going to be a simplified explanation, but sure. primates are very good at uh, vision. We are basically, and our brains have been reorganized and expanded towards uh, our vision, right? We're basically visual animals. And we we learn and we make decisions and we interpret the world basically via uh, visual stimulus. And of course we have auditory stimulus and um, you know olfaction and, and, and sensory um, information that is going into the brain, all those uh, um, uh, sensory um, inputs are extremely important, but basically, and, and the way primates have evolved and shared, shaped their brains is uh, through that those two different visual pathways, which are the dorsal and the ventral pathways, in terms of the identification of objects and also the um, you know the information related to the motion and the uh, the structure of different objects. So. Within the general uh, tree of, of mammals, right, primates are very, very unique. And within primates, great apes, hominidae, are extremely unique. So again, mm -hmm. something new and something borrowed. We have borrowed the way primates have uh, organized and evolved their brains, but then great apes have evolved their brain and expanded some areas which are related more to the processing of more complex information, more abstract information, and information that is known in the literature as rela uh, relative metrics, which is the information of, you know, um, the distance among uh, different objects, the time uh, between different things, all, all that information is called relative metrics. And great apes, especially, they are, we are very, very good at those. All right? So we have primates, special, within mammals, we have great apes, sp special within primates, and then humans, which are extra super special within that um, special specialization of great apes. So we are, you know, exceptional within a sex exceptional group of species within an exceptional order of mammals, right? Mm -hmm. And humans, uh, of course, we have uh, evolved from uh, a really common primate and great ape in terms of our brains, we have um, added extra uh, layers of complexity regarding the amount and the type of information that we are processing in some areas have, um, you know, being repurposed in terms of their function, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, uh, language, for example, the uh, recognition and the interpretation of texts, the ability to produce uh, tools and technology, all those mm -hmm. uh, brain areas are also present in other primates and they are also present in other mammals, but humans have specialized and increased the um, amount of, of those brain areas and the interaction uh, of, of those brain areas to actually produce something that it hasn't been seen before, uh, the appearance of humans such as technology, such as complex language, such as really abstract thinking, such as, uh, you know, uh, the production of written text. So every single thing that we are really um, used to right now in terms of communicating with others, uh, you know, generating this thing, which is internet and, you know, this virtual space and things like that, all those technological advancements and the way we are is basically because of our brain and basically because something that humans have been exceptionally good and very singular at that, which is the cumulative learning. All the information of our ancestors for thousands and even millions of years have been accumulated and we are learning more and more at each generation. And that is something that distinguishes us, our species from the rest of other species, cumulative learning. So, <clears throat> When you say that uh, primates, you know, pretty much had uh, similar structures to what humans have, uh, I mean, primates have, um, is it the fact, is it because of environmental reasons they started using certain parts of the brain that the other, other, you know, other primates didn't use and that's how, you know, they kind of evolved into 
the human brain is that is that what it is like the environmental factors and yeah um, absolutely so the, situations yeah so so the the physical context the environment it plays a crucial role into the selective pressures and therefore the the natural selection processes that are mm -hmm. acting into changing something at a structure um, a really highly connected structure which is the brain through different evolutionary um, you know trajectories and different uh, clays of, of animals so it seems to be that um, the human brain has uh, you know uh, been tested uh, through natural selection for so many so many times in so many ways right the same as 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 the brains of other species for example let's think about the uh, brains of bats right so bats uh, are a quarter of all the mammalian diversity that we have on planet earth and they have reorganized and rewired their brain just to be really tiny because they need to fly they are the only mammals that they can fly, fly. but at the yeah. same time they have reorganized their brain uh, in such a way that for example the vision is so important for primates but for example auditory information um is so so important for bats because many species they echolocate they are mostly blind some species they they don't see at all or very few uh, because most of them they are nocturnal right so and they have you know rearranged completely their cognitive specializations just to be able to um, you know, dominate the air and also just to dominate uh, uh, sensory information uh, through uh, their uh, uh, auditive systems in order to communicate, in order to navigate a really highly complex three-dimensional space, uh, such as, you know, uh, flying, right? And if you think about it, we, we humans, we are not able to fly, um, you know, biologically. So we need, mm -hmm. you know, other devices that we have overcome by creating the technology for, you know, uh, drones and planes and all that. Yeah. And for example, let's think about uh, other really uh, clear example of that, which is, for example, some um, species of cetaceans, right, or whales or some aquatic carnivores such as seals and sea lions. Uh, you know, all these species, they are underwater and they are mammals, of course, but they also, re they have reorganized their brain and in, in such a way that they are also, they develop uh, echolocation, but in, in the water, which is a very different medium than the air, right? So long story short, we have so many different uh, ecological pressures and uh, environmental demands for so many different brains of so many different species that natural selection has a lot of variation to play around. And the brain is the same as any other structure uh, in, our, in our bodies, right? In, in the physical presence of an animal. So the brain has also been shaped by natural selection in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, virtually an impossible task to actually isolate every single aspect that natural selection has played uh, around with the brain. That is also why we need to rely on behavioral information, that data that is related to how animals interact with their environment and with each other, right? And that information is clearly giving a, a, a huge component of how can we test uh, the evolution of specific behaviors, not anymore the evolution of specific areas of our brain or specific connectivity patterns, but the evolution of specific behaviors that allow us to be the way we are in terms of our intelligence. And those behaviors, I, I'm, uh, I, I mean, for example, how animals and, and humans learn, so learning, how we process um, our emotions, how we control our behavior, how we build and construct our memories, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the ultimate goal, just to understand how and why we are so important as species, also tells us a story about all the different suites of adaptation of all the diversity that we have on, on Earth right now in terms of how different animals solve similar or different problems their own way that's that's actually a good uh, segue for my next question because um i was pretty curious about you know brains they don't leave behind fossils so i was just wondering how do you actually study the evolution of human brain when you know when you don't have fossils and exactly I, so yeah. how can we start study the evolution of something that doesn't leave that doesn't any trace? right 
Yeah, so that, that is a, that is a wonderful question, and you know this is basically one of the aspects that is um, dividing uh, the study of um, the evolution of the brain into two main schools. The first school is called paleoneurology, which literally means the neurology, the new neuro, um, the neuroscientific aspects in the past, right? So we, we have the, 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 the name paleo, right? Like paleoanthropology, things like that. So it refers to how the brain was in the past. Mm. Um, so that school, um, that tradition, uh, uh, that research program, um, you know, conceives their data, construct their data based on what is called an endocast, which is basically the imprints of the, the, the brain that, you know, it's not longer there on the fossil record and how that brain gave uh, imprints and, and, and um, you know, signatures onto mm -hmm. the uh, aspect of the fossil record that actually fossilized, which is in this case, the skull, right? Mm -hmm. So people can reconstruct based on, on, on the skull of, of, of fossil species, how the brain was, and they can do that reconstruction, uh, you know, by using like, like, a, like a plaster, um, you know, like, or, or moles. Um, and, and that was very common in the 70s and the 60s. But right now with, with you know, with, with the emerger, emergence of, uh, you know, uh, virtual reconstruction, things like that, all those endocasts are made virtually, right? So we can actually have virtual or, or, or general endocast that tell us a little bit about the story, the evolutionary story of species that are not longer um, walking on earth right, or, or living on earth. Right. That right. is the first school, paleoneurology. The second school is using uh, statistical tools, which are called, the, uh, which are, we have so many tools, right? But the, the ones that I'm uh, working on and the ones that are the, the most commonly and widespread used are called the phylogenetic comparative methods, which is basically comparing, um, if, let's, let's think about the diversity of life as a tree, right? The, the tree of life. Mm -hmm. So the tips of the trees, right, the, the most external uh, distal aspects of those um, uh, branches of the tree are the species that are alive, right? And how these two uh, tips of the, of, the tree, of the tree are branching from a common ancestor, right? That's the way uh, we statistically um, and uh, mathematically model evolution, the relationship about, among different species. But the information that we, we that we gather that we measure are on the uh, brains of species that are uh, alive today, that uh, or were alive, uh, you know, at the time that we can actually grab uh, their brains and process them into histological sections. Because uh, what this second uh, you know research program, this second school is doing is actually measuring specifically the uh, areas of the brain and the um, uh, connectivity patterns of the brain of species that we have information of, which is basically the, the species that we have histological sections to study. Um, mm -hmm. So in that sense, it is uh, very important to, to understand that and to understand that we can ask different questions to different types of data. And that is something that is common across different, like all the disciplines within science. So, um, the paleoneurology, the first school, uh, has a very fine detailed information about the species that are no, no, not longer um, uh, here, right? The species, species that went extinct. And that is very important to actually know how was the uh, evolution of the brain from really uh, ancestral uh, species within the, the genus Homo, such as, you know, um, Australopithecus uh, afarensis, um, Homo erectus, uh, Homo neander neanderthalensis mm -hmm. until Homo sapiens, right? And then, uh, so we have, we have good information about that. That the second, um, you know, school doesn't have information. But on the other side, the second um, um, school has information about the diversity that we have as you know uh, as the, the order primates, but also other uh, primate uh, or other uh, orders of mammals. Uh, that are not primates. Uh, as I told you, like we have, you know, so many different um, orders such as, you know, rodents, we have, um, you know, cetaceans, bats, 
we have so so many diversity within mammals. Um, so that second, um, you know, program that second school of thought, which is the one that I'm working on, is actually measuring the uh, neuroanatomical diversity that we find uh, on living uh, extant species right now, and then we can model statistically by using different methods how those traits evolve through time by knowing the phylogenetic uh, divergence time of all these different tips of, of, the, of those branches of that tree. So we know that information and we actually model how that structure has changed over time by knowing that the genetic related, relatedness information of, of different species in the phylogenetic tree. So do you, is it more like a prediction or do you know that this is like, can you, can you like, you know, confirm that this is how it was? Yes, we can, we can statistically confirm that that mm. that is how different structures have changed throughout time and how, mm -hmm. for example, in some methods, we can actually estimate uh, with high percentages of, of statistical confidence how the ancestral condition uh, was for specific traits, right? Mm. Uh, and we can actually go back to different nodes of the evolutionary time. And uh, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, we can go beyond what uh, the limitations of the fossil record uh, actually is. Mm, interesting. So uh, what makes the human brain so complex you know, in comparison to the other vital organs in our body? Absolutely. Um, that is a work in progress. And <laughs> that is uh, something that I think it's going to be um, one of the most important tasks in, in humankind uh, to actually understand the organ that is responsible for who we are and our intelligence. Mm -hmm. We are the way we are because our brains and because the intelligence that our brain um, has, um, uh, you know, is, is able to produce, right? Um, so that is also why I consider that neuroscience, the study of, 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 of the brain, is the science of the 21st century. And we are producing so much information every single year. And we're producing more information than you know the previous years, like every single right. year, more and more information. And you know, you see around the world that there are so many neuroscientists that have, you know, such wonderful, fantastic, you know, research questions and and uh, you know, labs. Um, and, and you know, ultimately, is the understanding of, of our brain. Um, and you know, we, we also need to consider that you know what makes our brain so special and complex is something that we are still trying to figure that, uh, figure out. Right? Um, th there has been some um, um, analysis, some um, you know, really interesting um, uh, analysis that actually have measured the level of complexity that different system have. Uh, for example, the galaxy, uh, the universe, or for example, the, the human brain. And, you know, uh, actually, uh, the physicists has, have measured that. And actually, our brain, the human brain, is even more complex than the universe itself in terms of the amount of a connection and the, um, the, the ways that different areas of our brain and the uh, output that those connections have uh, are extremely, extremely complex. And, you know, and also talking about the amount of functional unit, units, which are the cortical columns uh, in our cortex, of course, and also the neurons that are the, um, you know, uh, so fundamental for how, um, you know, the vertebrate brain has, has, um, has evolved. So long story short, what makes uh, our uh, brain so special is something that we are still trying to figure out. But we have really cool, really clear leads in terms of what are the things, what are the components, what, what are the behavioral outputs, the behavioral, um, you know, end results of the brain. And we have really good, um, you know, a really good understanding of that. And, you know, uh, in terms of the human brain, uh, an exceptionally enlarged and extremely important uh, area is the, the part of the brain that we have here in our forehead, which is called the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, some people like to uh, define the prefrontal cortex as the director of the orchestra that uh, our brain is, right? So we have 
different instruments. Uh, we have different uh, components of the brain which are interacting to one another, but we need a CEO, we need a director of that orchestra, which is right. the prefrontal cortex. And that area, especially the, the, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has experienced a huge, like immense enlargement in humans in comparison to other uh, primates, especially great apes. So that um, area of the brain and the connection of that area of the brain, or more in general, the frontal cortex uh, to other areas of the brain is something that makes humans so unique. But at the same time, and this is something that always uh, blows my mind, uh, you know, we have components in our brain in the 20, you know, 2021 in our brains right now that has such a long evolutionary history. We have parts of our brain, such as the cerebellum, such as the amygdala, such as the basal okay. nuclei, that have been tested throughout evolution for millions and millions of years. So our brain is actually the complex interaction of uh, areas that have really different um, evolutionary histories. And that is something that is always, you know, so striking for me to understand, right? Um, that reminds me of the article that you had written. Um, I was reading it, uh, reading the five C's. Uh, it was talking about the uniqueness of the human brain. Uh, and I thought it'd be great to talk about that. So can you, can you take us through, uh, you know, the five C's and what makes the human brain more unique? Like, I know you just listed a few factors. Uh, yeah. I think this will kind of categorize, um, better so if yeah if you can tell us about the five c's yeah absolutely so um sandhya here um you, you're referring to one of the articles um you know i have um written and you can actually um we're going to have a link on the description below right. and in my in my uh article in, in medium i was basically summarizing um the um you know the findings the really interesting findings of um, um uh, a neuroscientist very, very uh, important, renowned neuroscientist um, uh, whose name is uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett. And in her um, latest book, which I will also recommend, it's uh, called uh, Seven and a Half um, Lessons About the Brain from last year, from 2020. She's actually, um, um, you know, summarizing uh, what she calls the five C's of like why our brain is so striking, uh, strikingly, um, you know, unique. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read them all, and then I'm going to be doing a, a little bit of a summary. So the mm -hmm. the five C's, according to uh, Dr. Feldman Barrett, are creativity, communication, coping, cooperation, and compression. So basically, you know, her her theory and her understanding of the brain is that all these different components are actually making the brain the way uh, it is in terms of the effective transmission of mental construction, right? The, the, that, um, those mental representation and then the creation of mental, model based, mental models based on those mental representation, which is basically the way, uh, you know, brains have uh, to learn and to actually predict information based on our memories. That is something that is, um, you know, unique for the way we understand the world and the, the environment uh, surrounding us. But that is something that is also present in all the other, um, you know, uh, mammals as well, that the creation of mental, um, um, mental construct, uh, mental representation and then mental models. Um, something that is unique to humans is that uh, idea of compression, which is basically the process of minimizing the redundancy in the transmission of information between the neurons to actually create summaries of our social realities. So we are exceptionally good at creating models and summaries of our uh, environment. And that environment also includes, and it needs to include, especially for humans, because the way we are in terms of uh, uh, how social uh, as a species we are, is actually the creation of, of social uh, mental models, right? In terms of how we actually predict and have an intuition about what other people, what other, uh, you know, individuals are thinking and how that um, prediction is actually based um, on, on the memories that we have 
on, on um, that we have uh, constructed and how that uh, prediction is actually you know, verified or falsified according to what is the, the outcome of the other person, what is the behavior of the, of the other person. And that is something that it is exceptionally uh, unique uh, in humans, right? That extrapolation of having all these relative metrics, as I mentioned before, having all that uh, construction of mental models, but also that, that way of understanding the, the world, the, the world surrounding us, also extrapolating that to uh, the social domain, right? And again, mm -hmm. it's the same story as, as something new and something borrowed. We have borrowed right. that from the uh, neural architecture of uh, um, our uh, ancestral um, uh, ancestors, right? We are talking about, uh, you know, all the ancestors that are common to other species as well, uh, and how we use that uh, infrastructure, that neural infrastructure to actually create something new, something unique for humans. Mm. Right. And um, so what is what is intelligence? Like, how did, how what, can you tell us, uh, tell us about the, the evolution of some features like, you know, intelligence or like memory, uh, habit formation, or like, like learning, there, there are several factors, there are several features which are uh, probably, you know, I wouldn't say unique, but I think more advanced in the human. So how did that come about? Yeah, absolutely. That, that 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 is a wonderful question. I'm really happy you you you're asking me about that. Uh, I also wrote, um, wrote another article that mm -hmm. you know uh, well, everybody is going to have access uh, in the description uh, that actually you know kind of discusses what we understand as intelligence, and it all depends on who you ask, right? Um, intelligence is something that um, you know the same as consciousness, right? Those mm -hmm. are concepts that. It all depends on how you define, what are the kind of questions that you can ask. So um, I, I have a really general um, understanding of what intelligence is. And for me, you know, uh, and for other researchers, uh, you know, many uh, forms of life, uh, including species that don't have even brains such as plants, they also have their own way of being intelligent. Right? right? So it all depends on what is your, um, your scope on what intelligence and your definition of what intelligence is. Uh, a definition that I truly love, uh, it is um, one that was, um, you know, defined by um, Jeff Hawkins in uh, a 2004 book that is uh, literally called On Intelligence, which is basically the idea that our brains and the, the, the brains of, you know, generally speaking, the brains of mammals, we're really good at predicting. So we're basically prediction machines. And our brains, you know, what we do uh, actually is predict something, so generate an expectation of something, but that is expectation is something that comes from what we have stored, right, our memories. So that interaction between prediction and memory it's what Hawking's is uh, and others are saying that that is the very basis of what an intelligent agent is. And we can actually extrapolate that understanding of, of intelligence to actually other agents that are not um, biological, they are not organic, such as machines, that therefore we also have artificial intelligence. But that is something that we can actually talk for, for another um, podcast episode I, I i think you know i'm absolutely sure it's going to be super super interesting um but basically the understanding of 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 intelligence that uh, you know myself and other colleagues have is that memory prediction interaction all the time all the time how we construct the mental models that we use for understanding our surroundings uh, uh the universe understanding also ourselves it is basically the creation, the creation and the construction of mental models that we are updating according to the predictions that we have all the time. So for example, um, a, a, an example that I, I, I love to, to tell uh, all the time is for example, the understanding that we have of someone that we believe we love, right? So we create a mental model of a person and that mental model is being updated all the time by the new information that that person or ourselves are actually getting from that uh, 
person, right? So right. where that person is from, what are what are the, the things that that person likes and, and don't like, et cetera, et cetera. All the information that we are actually getting from the environment is actually being updated all the time into the mental model of that person. And if we really like that person and we fell in love of that person and just FYI, love is actually a mental construction itself. So there's nothing. So, uh, and also according to Lisa Feldman Merritt, all the emotions that we have, that we experience are also mental constructions. So there is nothing mm -hmm. that exists itself as love or hate or, or fear. All those are mental constructions. But putting that aside, yeah. um, the thing is that our brains are actually constructing mental models all the time about every single thing that we experience and that we have, or, or even of ourselves. And th those mental models are con constantly being updated. And what happens when you know our prediction doesn't fit with the expectation that we have, right? With the, the suite of information that we already have about something or someone. So we have a, a, a like, it's, it's like, a, uh, like a dissonance, right? And we actually, when it, it is very clear for example, when we have feelings, for example, of love with someone else, and that person does something that doesn't feed our expectations, we, you know, completely need to re, you know, readjust and 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 update our okay. mental models according to what happened, and that is literally and virtually how every single thing and uh, and every, you know, every single aspect of our uh, experience is being built upon, is that memory prediction. Uh, model working uh, again and again and again. So, and and for that um, for that to happen, we need uh, the neocortex, which is the uh, around the seventy percent of our brain is everything that you see that is visible, right? Is those convoluted, you know, pinkish uh, areas of our brain. But we also need something that is called the mini brain, the cerebellum, which is at the back of um, of our brain. So that constant interaction of this uh, of the cerebrum, right, the cortex, and the cerebellum is just giving that um, um, you know uh, construction of models that we can actually interpret and understand um, our experience. Um, that made me think: uh, How does intuition come into play in all this? When you're talking about predicting memory, and uh, so I was thinking about. Is that what makes us more intelligent? Like, are humans the only species who have the power of intuition, or do other animals also do? Of course, other animals. Um, they have, um, you know, uh, a mechanism that is very similar to the one that we use. But in terms of intuition, is something that is extremely hard. I would say slash impossible mm. to actually test on other animals because. Right. Um, that is, that is basically one of the uh, limitations that many, um, you know, um, questions in neuroscience have is that we cannot ask um, uh, an animal how uh, it feels or what what it's that animal thinking, right? So that is also why neuroscience sometimes, which is a good thing and also sometimes is a negative aspect, it is very focused, it's very centered in the human brain, right? But we have so, so much to learn from the brains of other species. And we are actually discovering so many uh, interesting uh, aspects of the cognition of other animals, which is, you know, remarkable. And we, we can actually have a better un understanding of our own brains if we actually study more the brains and the behaviors and the complexity of, of other species. And again, there's, you know, so many species that they can do so many things that we are not being, you know, even, you know, able to do, right. uh, you know, like such as, for example, echolocation is one example, but, you know, how, uh, for example, um, uh, species that they live underground, they, they, they actually, all their, all their experience is actually based on the sense of olfaction and the sense of, you know, uh, tactile and things like that. So, because right. they live in, 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 uh, in caves and things like that. So that is something that, it is really strange or even impossible for us to imagine how other species are actually understanding their own um, uh, experience. And that is something that unfortunately, it is very hard to actually test scientifically. Uh, we have so many ways to actually, uh, you know, have a, uh, uh, you know, a gateway to actually uh, know that there are so many, like hundreds 
um, you know, more than a hundred years of uh, experimental uh, programs in terms of, you know, animal cognition and how different animals, uh, you know, they pass or don't pass different tests. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting to, 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 to actually understand that. And at the same time, combined with all the information that we are getting from the anatomy and the, um, you know, biology and the, um, you know, chemistry of the brain that we can actually uh, study in humans, but we can also study on other, um, um, you know, model species, such as, you know, rats, mice, uh, macaques, and some other uh, species of, of, uh, of primates. I mean, yeah, right. Like, e like, even when you're communicating intuitions to humans, it's because it doesn't make sense to others. Like, it, it's not rational for others. It, it's just rational for someone who gets mm -hmm. it. So I guess it's, it's even more difficult to scientifically prove it. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, exactly. But we would definitely know that expectations and the prediction of uh, of of actions uh, it is you know one hundred percent clear and present in a, in many other animals. animals. So in terms of you know in terms of the intuition of you know especially related to social aspects in terms of uh, you know having an intuition of oh if I do this this person is going to react like this that is something that is very very close to what human experience is and it's mm -hmm. um, in, in some aspect it all depends on which specific behavior we're talking about in some aspects is present in other uh, animals mainly primates and not all not all species of primate only in, in a handful of species but um, again when, when it's something very sophisticated and involves the understanding and the prediction of what other people are thinking or what other people are going to be reacting according to X um, um, behavior or action that it will take, that is something that is exclusively, um, you know, particularly for humans. And uh, what about common sense? Like, how, how common is common sense? Like, is that again a, a pretty, is it, <laughs> is it a human trait or... Um, you know, um, th th that is, that is um, you know, something that it all depends on, on what we understand about common sense. So in terms of, you know, doing the more, um, you know, rational, you know, if you have many options and choosing the one that is the more rational, uh, we, we, we know that other species, they also have decision-making processes mm -hmm. that also involve some sort of rationality. Um, but... Uh, in the level that we are talking about, um, you know, in terms of common sense uh, related to, you know, doing some action uh, related to, you know, to work, to study or things like that, that is something that is very, um, you know, um, that involves a lot of complex information being processed in a lot of different areas that are um, and, and pathways, neural pathways that are unique for humans as well. So we're, this is not a matter, it's, I, I would say it's a matter of like the level of complexity of the information that we need to um, have into consideration to make a specific type of decision uh, in terms of like common sense, right? Mm. Right. Um, there was another question that I wanted to ask. Yeah, um, so why are some parts of our brain called the reptilian brain? And so it's like, you know, some parts of our brain are like, we, like you like you mentioned in in, in your, in your uh, probably in, in your first few answers that we've retained some old parts and we've evolved to have some new parts so can you tell us a little about which parts of our brain are like really ancient and which part are relatively new absolutely yeah that, that is a fantastic question again like uh, i'm really glad that you're asking so so many interesting questions and mm -hmm. you know i'm very happy to to answer that because it's something uh, that I, I, I understand as a really big misconception about what reptilian brain means, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, we don't have any part of any reptilian or any other species brain in our brain. Our brain is entirely a human brain, okay? The thing is that people say in common, um, you know, um, wrongly uh, label that as, as a reptilian brain because you know, there are components in our brain, in, in the human brain that are also present in reptiles, in the brain of mm -hmm. reptiles or in the brain of, of uh, birds or in the brain of other um, uh, species of mammals, right? So that concept of reptilian brain is, 
is a is an end product of a really old and um, a really outdated uh, understanding of of the evolution of 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 the brain that was called the trion brain. Trion uh, means three, so basically three main components or, or ladder ladders or steps of a ladder of evolution that our brain have in terms of reptiles and then mammals and then humans, right? That is a, a, a very, um, it, it, it's a mistake to actually understand evolution in, the, in those um, uh, terms. And that is also very, uh, a, a very unidirectional linear understanding of, uh, of evolution. And that is something that it is, it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. Evolution doesn't work that way. And even though we have parts of the human brain that have a really long, really deep evolutionary um, uh, history, that doesn't mean that is um, uh, an area of the brain that is old or is, um, uh, you know, um, you know, like old school and, and we don't use it anymore. Mm. Uh, so let's think about this. Every single part of our brain, we, we use that, right? If we yeah. use every single part of our brain because if um, we don't use that over a uh, span of evolutionary time, natural selection doesn't favor that part of the brain or that mm. connectivity pattern. And, it, you know, it's gone from uh, right. in evolutionary history. So every single aspect, every single component of, of the brain has uh, passed the evolutionary test every single day. At every single generation, uh, we, we are passing that test. So that we have really old, um, you know, components of, of the brain that has a really deep evolutionary history, that doesn't mean that they are less important and that doesn't mean that they are, um, yeah, that they're going to be disappearing or that doesn't mean that, you know, it's a problem to share that exact same component of the brain with other species really distant as uh, reptiles, for example. So it is a mistake to, to say that we have a reptilian brain or a mammalian brain inside of our brain. It is um, you know, correct to say that we have a brain that is completely human and mm. components of the human brain have a really long, deep evolutionary history, but still they're extremely important for the cognition that makes uh, us the way we are. Um, we, we like to think that we are very like, um, you know, special and we are very, um, you know, cognitively unique. But at the same time, we need to understand that, that is also an end product of that linear understanding of evolution. And, uh, you know, that is also an end product of seeing evolution as an evolutionary, evolutionary ladder, uh, you know, reaching the, the, the top of something. We're not the top of anything. We're only another expression of intelligent life on this planet. And there are so many expression that we need to actually understand because that is the most um, important way to actually care about the, um, you know, the, the, the life of other species. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, and this is, uh, I'm going um, off the tangent here, but, no, you know, no for me, it's so important to understand the, that the, the importance of other forms of intelligent uh, experience that we have in, in this planet, because that will makes us uh, respect biodiversity way much more and actually protect species that are, you know, in, in so many, you know, different levels of danger, right? And many of those levels of danger are because of us, are because of, of human, uh, the human action on, on this planet. So that is also why I, I completely and truly believe that, you know, a really good way for, for us as human, um, as humankind to move forward in terms of protecting our planet and protecting all the species that we have is actually knowing more about the intelligence and the cognition of those species. And at the same time, knowing more about our own intelligence, but because we need to look at other species to actually understand ourselves. And that is something that is a, that is a, a vision of evolution, a vision of, of anthropology that is very, very distant to that, you know, linear um, uh, understanding of evolution that humans are the ultimate, um, you know, evolutionary process of, um, you know, the, the most evolved and the, and the better expression of, of, of life on earth. That is not how we understand, how we currently understand um, uh, our, our place on earth.
we're only a tiny particle in a really complex um, you know, system of that has you know infinite amount of, of interactions. So you you like pass some of the bubbles for people. So you, do you do you mean that uh, there will be more intelligent species than uh, more intelligent than than humans in the future, maybe? Yes, and you know it all depends again on how you uh, define intelligence, right? And mm -hmm. and I think that intelligence it is ultimately depending on the environment that that a species live in, right? right? And you know. Bats are extremely specialized and really highly intelligent for the type of environment that they have and they thrive on, right? right? right. And they have a, such a, you know, long evolutionary history. And, and let's think about this. I mean, if, doesn't, if something doesn't work, evolutionary ev uh, evolution, you know, um, in the long term, it kind of like that doesn't favor anymore and it, right. and it disappears, right? So every single expression that we of life that we see on, on, on Earth right now, it's it has passed the test of evolution for millions and billions of years, right? Mm. So I, I, I think that this is a very important thing to understand that we need to actually uh, remove that uh, anthropocentric view of science and biology, right? Anthropocentric means that we are the center of everything and that we are the, yeah. the ultimate example of uh, evolution and that is not the way all the other species have ex you know you know exemplary remarkable uh, adaptation to the or in, to their own environment and the brain and intelligence is only a part of that right mm -hmm. of of how species adapt to new right. and challenging environments right no that's that definitely makes a lot of sense and and kind of keeps uh, probably keeps all of us grounded <laughs> Um, you know, because all of us think that we are the most evolved species, and, um, and yeah. And let definitely. me ask you. Let me ask you a question. When I I, I ask you about what, how do, will you conceive, uh, you know, human evolution? You will immediately think about you know, a really like like the caveman, like like a like a Australopithecus, and then next to that, like walking like on a on a specific path. Then you will see. Uh, you know, another species a little bit more, like more erected, like, Erect, like yeah. a little bit. So, so that, um, you know, that understanding that we have of, of uh, human evolution is completely wrong because mm. th there is no, there is no direction to what uh, evolution uh, is working. We are not the ultimate uh, re re end result of, of an evolutionary path. And we are not the most sophisticated uh, form of, of intelligence or um, you know species that the, the, that there is. So that is also why I think that we need to uh, promote a more diverse, less anthropocentric understanding of uh, biology and evolution and life. That is also why that you know ladder of evolution is so wrong, and we need to actually understand you know. Um, diversity more as a tree if you want to use uh, some sort of analogy to something that it is true that we have you know common ancestors for every species that but all species are actually evolving and thriving and passing the test of evolution and some species are becoming extinct and some others evolved and speciating to others etc cetera, etc cetera. like like a tree of life right mm. um so yeah, I think that for, for, from the most common sense in terms of how we actually visually describe something as complex as evolution, we need to actually be less anthropocentric and more um, understanding of all the, the beautiful biodiversity that, uh, that exists. Mm, wow, that's beautiful. Um, before we move on to uh, the, the next segment, if you can, if you can briefly tell us uh, what your research entails, like what are you currently working on for your PhD? Well, thank you so much. So um, as, as people have clear by now, I do evolutionary neuroscience, which is basically mm -hmm. uh, studying the evolution of the brain to understand how and why humans are so, um, you know, cognitive, spe uh, specialized cognitively. Um, so right now I have um, two uh, research programs uh, and I am understanding different aspects of brain evolution. On one hand, I'm extremely passionate about understanding how the um, 
cortex have been evolving uh, in terms of size, but also in, in terms of the reorganization of the different mm -hmm. cortical areas. And a fascinating, um, um, you know, um, feature happens that in so many species, humans included, the cortex, the cortical sheet, starts to to fold and bend. So the, the the understanding that we have of our brain is something that is like extremely wrinkly and and you know really folded. And that folding pattern, which is called cortical folding, that is something that has evolved throughout evolutionary time. So we have species that are their brains are really smooth and with without you know any any folds. And we have other species that are really highly folded. So that folding pattern is something that has changed throughout evolutionary times. And very important for uh, our research uh, questions, the folding of the brain, it is a proxy of how, how much computational power the cortex has. And the cortex, by definition, is one of the most important areas for um, animal intelligence. So having animals that they, they have cortex that are really thin and not folded and have a other species that their cortex are really thick and more folded, that tells you something about the amount of information that, that those different cortices can um, uh, work with. And I study the evolution of cortical folding across, different, uh, uh, ac across all different mammals to mm -hmm. actually understand how the reorganization of the cortex has changed uh, throughout time, giving us really clear indication, a very good proxy of how cortical processing of information has uh, evolved through time. That is a, a, um, a research, um, uh, um, you know, project that I'm working on for, for, you know, I've been working on for the last uh, few years, and I'm very happy to tell you and tell our audience that I'm going to, I'm wrapping up uh, some analysis, I will be publishing those results very, very soon. So I am, um, you know, very happy about those results. And I truly believe that, um, you know, all the data that we have um, collected and the results that we have are going to be changing some aspects that we have in terms of cortical folding in, in particular, but also how we understand uh, in general uh, animal intelligence and specifically the intelligence that is derived from uh, cortical activity. And on the other hand, the, the other project that I have is, uh, is my dissertation project, the, the project that I aim to finish my uh, doctoral studies with, which is related to a beautiful, very, very important um, um, connectivity uh, pattern that, we, uh, that exists in the brain that is called the corticostriatal system. So that neural network is actually connecting the cortex, right? This extremely important uh, part of the brain, which has been, uh, you know, has been uh, 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 suffered a lot of folding throughout evolution. So the cortex is connected also with the striatum, which is um, a really important component that is deep, uh, uh, you know, inside our brain, which is the main input of what is a system that is called the basal nuclei, um, uh, also known as basal ganglia. So mm -hmm. that striatum is actually um, filtering specific uh, uh, types of information of our cortex, right? So we have information that is more related to sensory motor um, aspects, others, uh, other, uh, other information that is more uh, abstract, more related to the actions, uh, and other type of information that is extremely abstract, which is more related to the goals that different uh, animals have in terms of how to reach uh, you know, from, from one point to the other in terms of behavior. So lo and behold, extremely interesting is that specific um, nuclei of the striatum are actually uh, filtering specific types of um, uh, cortical information that is being relayed to those uh, specific um, nuclei. So what I'm doing is actually measuring the striatum uh, in general, but also the, uh, the volumes the volumes and the connectivity patterns of those specific nuclei of the striatum uh, and compare them across primates to actually see how different learning mechanisms and different uh, stages of the regulation of behavior and how animals actually construct habits and 
they um, build, um, you know, they make decisions uh, have evolved throughout, um, you know, the evolution of primate cognition. So I am also working with, um, you know, a system that is also involving some subcortical areas. So in that sense, I am, uh, you know, very interested in how the cortex and cortical areas have evolved, but also some uh, other areas that are evolutionarily more um, conserved, uh, have a deeper evolutionary history, such as the striatum also has evolved in tandem with the cortex. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, to study the variation throughout time of parts of the brain that have different evolutionary histories. Mm, that's very interesting. And I look forward to reading some of the results in your paper when it comes out. Um, yeah, before we move to the, uh, the part about science communication, which we are both passionate about, uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, can you give us names of some books that is written for, uh, you know, for the general public to understand, uh, which you think are like, you know, good uh, books to start with to understand the human brain or like you know the evolution and absolutely. i will put that in the description too yeah absolutely so this is actually uh, some sort of my, my personal recommendation to uh, anyone that is interested interested in diving into good research and good understanding um you know research-based understanding of how our brain works. And these books are really recent and they mm -hmm. are kind of like the state of the art of how neuroscientists mm -hmm. are actually understanding the brain. And, you know, neuroscience is part of science and science evolves also throughout time. And right. this is a, a sample of how we understand right now, you know, in the 21st century of how uh, our brain works and how our brain has evolved. So you're going to be uh, writing this in the description. So I'm going to be right. reading the titles of these uh, um, books. The first one that I want to recommend is from 2016. It's called Neurobiology, A Functional Approach. And it's written by one of my favorite uh, authors and one of the role models that I have in my field, which is Georg Strieder. Um, very interesting uh, book. Uh, you know, it has a lot of really, really interesting information. The other book that I recommend from 2020, it's also some, uh, you know, a book that I um, mentioned before, it's called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain by Lisa Feldman Barrett. Also mm -hmm. very remarkable, extremely exquisitely written book. And the last one, the third book that I recommend from this year, 2021 by Jeff Hawkins is called A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. And it's basically a summary and uh, the new understanding that we have of uh, cortical columns and how uh, organic intelligence can actually tell us about the basic uh, algorithms of intelligence to actually extrapolate that understanding of organic intelligence into the construction of better and optimized artificial intelligence. So mm. extremely recommended book. Um, and I would love to, to know about what people have to say, uh, you know, um, below in the comments. So I would love to, you know, just to have this conversation open. Sure. I'll definitely link this. Uh, maybe if there are, uh, they must be a, a, available on Amazon to I will, yeah. Yeah. I will give you all the all the links that you need to uh, that you great. need to upload. So don't worry about it. Yeah, sure. So I'll put all I that and I'll yeah, that'll be great. And and yeah, like like I said, I would definitely love to hear from the audience about um, you know about the book and the experience and what, whatever they've learned from these books. Um, yeah. Now coming uh, coming back to science communication. Uh, I love to ask this question um, to everybody, to or to most of my guests who who actively, you know, uh, practice science communication. And uh, every time uh, I've asked this question, I I got a different answer. And each I'm uh, like, no answer is perfect, uh, as in like there's no wrong or right answer. But it's just everyone has their own definition, and it's just so beautiful. So, what is your definition for? Uh, science communication, what does it mean to you? Yes, so I think that um, sharing science and sharing the knowledge that scientists um, generate all the time is a crucial component of the modern interaction of science with the world and scientists with the world, right? Um, so I think that science communication is a crucial fundamental, um, you know, um, 
component of every research that uh, is, car is being carried, uh, carried out, right? Um, and science communication needs to be, um, you know, effective, but at the same time, it needs to be inclusive. And that is something that is very different uh, of the current understanding of science communication, which is very different from how, um, you know, our ancestors conceived uh, science and the, the sharing of scientific results, right? We're talking about, you know, 50 years ago, 90 years ago. Uh, so there was, uh, you know, traditionally this um, concept of science is only for the elites and science is only for the people that actually are able to go to, um, to have uh, education, right? And, and, and that, uh, you know, uh, knowledge always remain in the, the high spheres of power, right? So that is also why, um, you know, so many uh, libraries around the world have that motto on their entrance, which is, you know, knowledge is power, right? Mm -hmm. It literally having good information, specifically scientific inf good information, it is uh, something that make people more or less powerful. Uh, and that is something that was, you know, traditionally um, located on, you know, the elites uh, in the world. I think that, you know, giving that, uh, you know, little uh, historical perspective apart, I think that we are living in such interesting moments in the history of, of humankind in the sense that, that this type of connectivity that we have right now in terms of internet and, you know, virtual spaces and the, the amount and the level of integration that we have among different um, uh, you know, spheres in, in, in society, it is something that we haven't experienced, uh, you know, at any point in time, we are living through historic times right now. And I think that science and specifically science communication is actually at the forefront of promoting and, uh, you know, sharing information that for, for many different aspects, such as, you know, the development of vaccines, the fighting against different um, you know, diseases and things like that. It is a matter of life and, and death. So mm -hmm. that is also why I, I, I conceive science communication as a, a crucial component of the scientific method, right? It needs to be there. Scientists need to be able to effectively and inclusively communicate their findings because for, for all aspects of science, but more uh, um, especially for, for specific aspects of science or specific topics, you know, you need to, for people just to actually make good decisions based on what science is telling us, right? And science is, uh, has been able to, you know, bring humankind to the moon or to develop vaccines in, in, in a record, um, you know, uh, time uh, in terms of fighting, uh, you know, uh, a current uh, pandemic. So we also need to actually promote and share th those benefits to whole, the whole humankind to every, you know, sector and aspect of, uh, of, of society. And, you know, human societies are so uh, diverse that we need to make that extra effort to actually communicate science to historically underrepresented uh, minorities, which, you know, historically have been, you know, uh, set aside from that, from those elites of power. So I think that mm -hmm. science communication is actually the component of science among many others that need to be very, very inclusive and very effective in the way we communicate. So science communication, just to sum up uh, my definition, it's something, uh, it's, it's an action led and supported by scientists and by funding agencies as well, which is very important to actually, you know, translate into the world the, the changes that we want in the world, the changes that uh, we want in our, uh, in our children to have. Uh, those ideas that we conceive in the lab, they need to be in the real, in the actual world. And that is science communication, according to me. Okay, no, that's great. And uh, what are your I current love, projects? Oh, sorry. I, if if we have a minute, I would love to know your actual uh, definition of of science mm. communication. I would love this to be some sort of a conversation. Sure. Um, so, I again, I don't have like a like a definition, but uh, 
one of the reasons that I got into this and I thought it was 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 important is because uh, there's a lot of myths, there's a lot of misconceptions, and uh, there's also a lot of interesting things um, around us. And uh, I I'm a very curious person, and I'm very I'm like I'm passionately curious, and uh, I think that everybody is, and um, and not, not all of them can you know look up papers and then understand the results. So we need to as scientists or like people in the field of science, I think it's our responsibility to not just inform our results to our peers, but also make the general public aware about what's happening. And I think pandemic was probably one of the uh, is, is the right example for where there's been a lot of, uh, there's a spread of miscommunication, there's, there's a spread of virus, but there's also a spread of miscommunication. And uh, I think uh, science communication kind of helped um, convey what's to an extent, I, I agree that there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge out there, but uh, there are a lot of doctors in different places and scientists, virologists, and um, uh, vaccine makers. They've all come together and have like they've not only just shared the data. Like in the last two years, I think all the all the medical terms, all the jargons have become you know daily daily usage words. Uh, so I think uh, science communication has that kind of a power. So and I was also like, you know, like I said, I, I was like passionately curious about a lot of things because uh, like science is that kind of a topic where like it's, it's just curious. And uh, I tried reading about uh, a few things online and then I thought as a typical lazy person, what is the easiest way to, you know, learn things? Just talk to new people, talk to people in that particular field and understand uh, understand from them. You know the experts or the people who are working in that field, and I thought that's that's the best way to learn and then share the information with others. So that's probably my bit of uh, communication. Absolutely, and you know I I, I couldn't agree uh, with you more, uh, Sandhya. Um, and it, you know that what you mentioned that uh, you know historical paradigm that you mentioned in terms of uh, you know the pandemic that is something that was my personal call to enlist into the front in, in science communication. Um, mm. Because you're absolutely right. We are living through a pandemic, but we are also living through an infodemic, which is the presence mm. of fake news and information that is not backed up by science and by, by research and by data. And that is something that I, I took that call as something very, very personal. And also because I come from an underrepresented minority and I come from a country such as Argentina that don't don't have much funding for education and science. So I, I I told myself I need to use my experience, I need to use my skills, my talents, and to devote my time and energy to inform people about the benefits of of having some sort of um, uh, scientific literacy. And that I think that that is something so fundamentally important that will makes us, you know, a, a better, um, you know, inhabitant of this planet, uh, ultimately, because there are so many things that we need to keep understanding, to keep learning about life and about uh, our interaction with, with life in this planet. And we're talking about climate change, about uh, other zoonotic diseases, you know, of course, COVID, uh, you know, SARS, COVID-2 is not going to be the last virus that we're, we're yeah. going to need to face. So why don't we, you know, pause the game and actually have some more time and some more energy and funding to actually promote and share in a good way, in an effective way, in an inclusive way, what we know about all these different topics. So we can actually inform people, people that make the decisions such as politicians or people that are actually make decisions every single day, like, like a general audience, mm. the importance of ruling their lives and ruling their decisions by information that is backed up by science. Yeah, no, that's, that's completely, um, and, and, and I think to a large extent, people have also understood the importance of understanding these things, because there's been, there was so much, uh, there was a lot of chaos during, you know, the time when pandemic started, and before the before the vaccines were rolled out 
um it was definitely a moment of agony moment of panic and uh, this kind of information um uh, like yeah it's easy to say that uh, there was a lot of miscommunication and people took uh, you know uh, like um how do i put it um they some 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 decisions weren't uh, <laughs> correct but there were also people who like you know who went back who who read through things and uh, like also made sure that they took care of themselves like took enough precautions so i think it's instead of just looking at the negative side of it we should also look at the positive and side of it and just uh, be grateful that uh, what the the impact of science communication has brought about in in this time of uh, you know the pandemic yeah yeah absolutely i absolutely agree with you uh so what are your what what are your science communication projects i know you've written a few articles but other than that like what what are your passion projects in science communication yeah so um one thing about me is that um i have this thing that i'm so passionate about so many different things at the same time mm. which is um always a challenge to to balance uh with you know with my research with my teaching and and other responsibilities and also my personal life um so i am very interested in um writing um and and and, and blogging uh that is something that i have done in the past i truly enjoy and it's something that it, you know brings me a lot of uh a lot of um you know creative energy and and very positive vibes so i i love writing um so that is something that i have done and i'm still doing uh i've done you know some um uh you know blogging and and writing for for my own as a freelance but also i have worked with with several uh institutions as well and i'm currently working for for our uh, other media outlets on on writing so that is something that it is um you know very uh very deep in my heart and I'm, i'm very grateful to have that opportunity uh other thing that I, i i truly love is you know interacting with other um media um you know uh platforms such as radio uh television and also mm-hmm. podcast and i have you know very very i've been really grateful to have the opportunity to to appear on on you know radio uh, and television uh you know programs and also mm-hmm. some podcasts as well um you know we we are in a podcast right now so mm-hmm. i'm very also interested in that and i have you know a lot of uh, experience into that on the production side but also on the on the on being on on the other side of the of the of the screen of the of the camera in in, in this sense um what is really interesting is uh, you know um you know I have also been uh you know interviewed in in you know um media outlets from from my from my home country from Argentina and that is something that you know I, it is very nice to also you know talk to your people talk to people that you grew up with and people that share the, you know your same culture in terms of you know the, the special things about you know what someone that has come from Argentina has to tell about you know science and uh, other different topics so i i also think that you know uh you know bridging different uh cultures and bridging and connecting different um countries in terms of uh what we do is is very very important um and at the same time i'm uh, i have the um you know the 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 opportunity to work uh you know professionally as a, a communicator and as a scientist communicator and, and data visual uh, visualizer for um uh many different organizations and institutions i am currently working uh at the jbg uh, jbjc which is it stands for jb johnston club for evolutionary neuroscience i am the head of communications and the manager and the coordinator of social media and the jbjc is uh uh the world leading uh organization in evolutionary neuro- neuroscience and um you know i'm very proud to be part of that uh, organization doing all the, the the social media outreach and the communication of the fantastic work that uh, all our members and um uh, are doing uh, in terms of understanding the evolution of the brain at the same time i'm working uh at the um um stem uh, advocacy institute which is a mm-hmm. an ngo is known as sai located where where you are right now in boston mm-hmm. uh and i'm you know very grateful to be part uh uh of the of the of the of the team of the uh, administration team um in charge of the communications and we are 
uh, you know, promoting so many uh, interesting events and all the different outreach uh, and uh, advocacy uh, projects that all our residents and fellows have uh, at SAI. So we're also gonna be including the link to um, the STEM Advocacy Institute uh, in the description for uh, all your listeners um, and your audience to, to check it out. It's, it's amazing work that uh, has it's been doing uh, um, in you know in, in this country and also um, projects uh, inter international projects uh, around the world uh, and the um, other institution that I'm working on is the um, it's called RASET and it's uh, um, the Royal Academy of Science which is led by the um, by the science princess the the princess of Iraq which is also a neuroscientist. Um, mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's such a wonderful, wonderful uh, woman, uh, and I have. I'm very happy to be working with her um, in in many different projects. And we are working right now on uh, all the different um, you know campaigns and, and promotion of science, uh, especially science that is targeted uh, to and from uh, women and girls. So they have launched this uh, campaign that is called uh, the International. Day for for women and girl in sci girls in science, which is every uh, February 14 every year, and uh, I I am very proud of being part of this uh, of this new campaign and this new uh, project. And hopefully, we're going to have we're going to be launching many different and new projects uh, this uh, February uh, 14, uh, 2022, in the um, General As uh, Assembly of uh, of United Nations. So I'm very uh, happy to be also part of the communication aspect of the wonderful things that uh, RASID is doing for the inclusion of, of women and girls in science. Wow, that's that's really impressive. And I, I, I can't I can't believe that you're kind of juggling between your PhD and you know a couple of projects and <laughs> this. Just, place, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's really impressive and very interesting. Um, I guess that's these are some of the questions that I I had, and uh, uh, I'll and I'll link your um, Twitter handle, and if anyone wants to you know have a discussion or if they have any doubts, people can reach out to you. Um, and and I don't know the topic is such. It was it was really great talking to you about um, you know about intelligence and evolution of human brains, and I I definitely had a great time. Um, so thank you very much, um, you know, once again for um, making time for this, uh, you know, uh, with your busy schedule. I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to make time and, uh, you know, get this, um, get this for our viewers. Um, and uh, we have many such, you know, interesting topics coming up in, in the further episodes. Um, so until then, keep, be curious, uh, be passionate and nothing is rocket science. See you. Thank you so much. Have a good one.